out of my training in Philadelphia uh, in ophthalmology, eye surgery, um, I wanted to go to Northwest India to the Punjab. Uh, in, in the sick capital city there is Amritsar, and that's where the Sikh religion is. And the Sikhs are very wonderful people. So I went out there for six months uh, in 1956, from J July to December. And I, I brought with me a lot, a thousand of dollars worth of equipment, I gave it to them. I showed them Western techniques for cataract surgery and so forth. And then in, in December of that year, 1956, I flew then to Calcutta and I get ready to leave because I had to leave because of the uh, uh, time was up. But then they say, you cannot leave till you pay income tax on the money that you earn. I said, but I didn't earn any money here. I don't, devoted my time. They said, sir, no one works for nothing in India. You pay income tax on whatever they gave you. I said, they didn't give me anything. I donated my time. In fact, gave them thousands of dollars worth of equipment. She said, no, can't, you can't leave tomorrow and, and go to Bangkok on the way back. I said, well, what am I to do? I'm stuck here. He said, well, there's a commission on the other side of uh, Calcutta. Go, and he's the only one that can sign, get you out. Well, I went over there, in a big monolithic British building, big windows, 15 feet high, no screens, no window panes. I said, Commissioner, Dr. Singh, up on the third floor. I went on the third floor, he's out to lunch. I sat there, somebody walked by, and I said, well, the commissioner's gone. He'd be back what, for lunch, I'm sure, 20, 30 minutes. He said, sir, this is India. We take several hours, lunch breaks. I said, you're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. Well, I sat down there. I said, what am I to do? I'll have to wait. So I sat down there on the bench next to a window. And I heard, woke up suddenly. I said, my God, I hear bing, bing, bing. I said, that's a bad and bitten shuttlecock. I looked out the window and hear all these lunchtime civil servants out there playing badminton for money, big time money out there, many courts. So I said, well, I might well, this commissioner, I'm sure, is down there. So I'll go down there and join and see what's going on. So I went down there and I watched him for about a half an hour. And suddenly, one team, guy said to his partner, I have got to leave. I have to go on. He said, look at the money we put, the rupees in this big bowl. We're going to be rich. I've got to leave. So the guy who left sat down next to me, just really upset. He said, hey, you, you play badminton? I said, well, are you any good? I said, well, it depends on who you talk to. Now, parenthetically, when I was 14, I played so much badminton, I won the city tournaments over and again in 1940, 1941, fight to two, singles and double. I, but I didn't want to say anything about that. But he said, well, I'm desperate. Will you be my partner? I said, yeah, okay. We went out there. And Dr. Collins, we were like two guys made in heaven. <laughs> we beat all the teams, beat them. At the next hour, half to two hours, and the rupees were put into the pot. When we got through, that, my partner hugged the boy and says, I'm a rich man now. I'm going to be a rich man. And then suddenly he turns to me and says, I should give you some of this. I said, no, it's okay. You keep it because I came here for another reason. He says, okay, I'll keep it. Then he sat down and said, who are you? Why are you here? I said, sir, I'm here to see one of the commissioners about leaving Calcutta tomorrow. What's the commissioner's name? I said, Rockbeer Singh. He said, that's me. I couldn't, couldn't believe what he said. That was a guy I was playing with. Come upstairs. I told him the whole story. He said, Reese, this is the damnedest story I've ever heard, really. It has authenticity, but the thing is, if I do something like this and you're not telling me the truth, then I could lose my, my, my job as in the career here. But on the other hand, I feel there is a vulnerability and authenticity that you have that sounds, you're telling me the truth. I said, why would I lie? Why? He said, I believe you. He signed it. Next day, I went out airport, 
I mean, that night, uh, ready to leave the next day. And then I wrote a letter to the New Delhi Times, biggest newspaper in India, about 400 million people at that time. Now it's 1.3 billion, but 400 million. And I sent a letter to the editor about this wonderful civil servant and what he did for me. And I mailed it to him. It then a month later, he wrote to me in Philadelphia and said, Reese, thank God you were telling the truth. <laughs> it was all confirmed. And your letter to the editor about me has gone all over India. I'm the most popular, the most talked about civil servants in India today because of what I did for you. And she says, I want to thank you again. <laughs> but it has immeasurably enhanced my career. <laughs> How can that happen? Yeah. How can all that happen? And yet, we both were vulnerable to each other. Mm -hmm. See, I, I think just, um, so many patients might hear this story, or just whoever's listening might hear the story, like I did the first time and think it's so magical, you know, that you knew how to play badminton, he was playing badminton, but that's just one piece of the story. That's a, that's a great coincidence, a great synergy that that happened. But the other piece as a cancer patient and someone who can adapt is that you still had hope. You went to Calcutta having hope that you could speak to the right person and the right person would hear what you had to say. The right person would get you out of the country and you, you hung on to that hope even through the long lunch or wherever he was or what was gonna happen. I mean, you didn't give up, you know, you didn't give up hope, but you showed vulnerability and then he showed vulnerability and then you both won. I mean, that's that's adaptation. I think that that's uh, in anybody's life. They can take that situation and uh, apply that to their own life and just keep their head up and keep their hope. And then, you know, be honest. Be honest when you need to, you know, just be vulnerable. Hey, this is the, my problem. This is what I need. And maybe you were so honest, he didn't believe you even at first. That's why he said, you really better be telling the truth. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just, I can't believe it all has happened. I just can't. I still got the letter from him. He sent to me, thanking me for, for telling him the truth. Mm -hmm. 